Happy homecoming. Welcome into Camel Call Friday with Evan Budrovich. I'm Chris Haymeyer. We're going to start this podcast. We usually don't have this, but we've got some breaking news. There was talk that there would be no camels on campus. There are going to be camels, plural, on campus. Evan, who is now on the university size as well as still working a bunch in sports, has the breaking news hot off the press. Tell us about the camels coming to homecoming, Evan. How about this? In Shelby, North Carolina, yep. which is five minutes from Gardner-Webb, right. there's a camel farm located on the far side of the state. We usually use a company in Fayetteville. They were having some issues, couldn't find enough camels, so sure. calls were made across the state, and from the eastern half, we're bringing the camels over. So five camels for the parade. Now, I don't know where you line up five camels in a parade down Main Street. They're all going to be in the parade? Five are coming. I think four for the parade, maybe one for the football game, so they can do the rides and everything. But the parade's at noon. Uh, Dr. Creed and yeah. Kathy will be sitting in a sports car in the front of the parade. Sure. The camels will follow suit. And then at football, starting around 3 o'clock, an hour before the game, you can get your pictures with, I, I'm guessing, two camels off near the strength and conditioning room in that far end zone over there. Wow. Make sure you, you pay attention to all of the Because who doesn't love a picture media. with a camel? No. That's and, the best part and, of homecoming. And on homecoming. We're joking a little bit about camels, which we never should because we are the fine camels. And if they weren't in the parade, would it really be a homecoming parade? But if you have never been to Bowie's Creek on a homecoming Saturday, you're, you're really, really missing out. Again, we look at the world through orange-colored glasses, but... It's a bustling place on a football Saturday period, but on a homecoming Saturday, Bowie's Creek is full, you guys. I mean, Bull, Bowie's Creek is is busting at the gills, and they've done a great job from the university side and from the athletic side to really make it. It's, it's not just about a parade and a football game anymore. There's so much going on really all week leading up to it, and, and Evan has all of that great information. This is your homecoming headquarters right here on the Friday Camel Call podcast. I want to give a ton of credit to alumni relations. They do a lot of the work to yeah. organize this, but it starts at 9 a.m. with the Golden Club 50-year reunion. This is the class of 70, 71, and 72. Uh, because of COVID, they're, yeah. they're grouping them all together. But I did some research in the old yearbooks. The fall of 71, which is 50 homecomings ago, was the first ever fall homecoming. It used to be in the spring around a basketball weekend, right? and it moved to the fall in 1971, the students wanted to vote on it, and they'd rather have it in the fall so they could dress up and not be in the snow or the bad weather and all that stuff. So they had their fall dance in Carter Gym, and then their homecoming weekend was wrapped around that. So that's, that gets it started at 9 right. a.m. You can take campus tours with alumni, with students. They're going to have all these guided tours in the chapel and the union and, and just across campus. Then my favorite part is at noon, the parade, because when you have five camels roaming down the yeah. street— all the student organizations get their different carts and they set them up and you'll see Dr. Creed, you'll see just churches in the area. A lot of alumni bring their kids and they all interact on the street and take pictures and like Jared Freeze, they have a reunion every year where all of their alumni from the same group come together and they hang out on the street and bring candy corn and their kids and a lot of the cheerleaders will throw candy into the on the side yeah. of the road. So it, it's a big, it's a big, it's a long parade and, and, Everybody in the parade, whether you know you are the accounting club or if you're the cheerleaders, you have a lot of candy. If you're a kid and you come here, and there's a lot of people that go, but 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 the car to candy and kid to candy ratio it's is out of this 2.0. world. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's really out of this world. So then you can go over to the alumni village, which is across the street, right in that first parking lot when you pull into the football. Right stadium. in front of football, yeah. So there'll be a live band at. At 2 o'clock, that'll yep. get started. There'll be tents. There's food set up. You can just meet and greet. They'll have food trucks lined up. So there's beignets. There's a taco food truck, barbecue. I mean, you name it. There's probably some camel thing mixed into I don't know about. The cheerleaders and the dance team will show up with Gaylord and, and Gladys closer to 2.30 or 3. But basically, in the time you would tailgate, you can just meet alumni, interact, have a lot of fun. I mean, there's always there's the cannon that blows up an hour before yep. the game. So you hear that. You get to see the orange smoke. It's the best day to represent what a college atmosphere is like in Campbell. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. And look, before football, it it, it wasn't like this. It was uh, 
it was still homecoming has been a tradition, but it, but it really, it really has an awesome feel. So, so we invite, if you can only be there for a couple things, if you can be there all day, it's great. And the weather oh. is going to be outstanding. It's going to feel like fall, but it's going to be sunny, no chance of rain. It's, it's going to be great. Because that put a little damper, if you will, on last Saturday's game. The Indeed. team played awesome, yep. but a little bit of wet weather, wind, but I tell you what, weather high of 68, yeah, no clouds, it, It'll really be – we haven't had this in three years of an ideal weather, great day, so I'm, I'm excited. And sporting event-wise, everything but cross-country, all of our fall sports that are in season will be playing this weekend. It, it starts on Friday as our women's soccer team. They have a huge conference game against Presbyterian. It's Friday at 7. It's 34-30, our, our women's soccer team celebrating 30 years, trying to raise some some money as well. So they've invited all their alumni back. It's going to be senior night because of the big crowd. So really, as we've been having some, some different events all week, that the sporting events part of it starts on the 7th. And by the way, our women's soccer team still has not lost a game. August 28th, the non-conference game at a very good Liberty team was the last time our Campbell soccer team is watching, has lost. And there's only been two ties in there, too. They are on an incredible run, unbeaten in conference play, unbeaten in over a month. It's a neat conference race, too. Charleston Southern's really good this year. Gardner-Webb is, is really good on the women's side. There's like three or four teams that could all win that title. You know, the Camels did tie this week, but they'll be fired up for Friday. I, I'm not worried about that. When this team's locked in, they're really good. I tell you what, though, with the playoffs only being four teams in yep. the Big South, yep. it's a heck of a race. You know, the men's soccer team, they'll dominate the league for the most part. The women's team could be one through four, and I think all four of those teams have a chance. Yeah, yeah. Both the soccer is just the top four teams in the conference will qualify for the conference tournament and then that automatic ticket to the NCAA tournament. Speaking of unbeaten, Evan, Campbell Volleyball, uh, sensational. They uh, at Radford on Thursday, but coming into this week, a perfect 4-0. Who else is undefeated in the conference? Low point. The hated High Point Panthers. Hate is a strong word, but, you know, the High Point Panthers who are the big rivals. The last two years, it has been High Point and Campbell in the finals of the Big South Conference Volleyball Tournament. High Point won two years ago. Campbell won last year, punching their ticket to the NCAA Tournament. They're picked to be one and two. This will be the, uh, I believe, the the first of two meetings. They'll meet at high, had high Point later on in November. By the way, the tournament is at High Point. So, again, a lot on the line when Campbell and High Point meet. That's at 2 o'clock after the parade that starts at 12. The best part about that matchup is High Point just played Pitt on Sunday, top 10 Pitt. That match went to four sets and could have gone to five. High Point's really good. Yep. Campbell's playing their best volleyball right now. Yep. Four dominant wins in the Big South. So Campbell does play this week, but mano y mano, the two best teams in the league, That's you got to see that if you get a chance. Speaking of unbeaten, Evan. Wrestling? Our Campbell men's soccer team, and I'll get back to wrestling as well as they have their uh, orange and black, are – Men's soccer team undefeated in conference. They're 2-0-1. They've won their last games in conference at home against Winthrop at Longwood on Wednesday by a combined score of 10-1. to So that offensive juggernaut that may have disappeared in what has been um, a little bit of not quite up to their standards, they are cruising in conference. And they'll take on Asheville. So they are moving things around. The, the football game, of course, is at 4. We'll talk a little bit about that. But 8 o'clock on Saturday night to end what we hope is going to be a fantastic winning homecoming weekend is the men's soccer game, which you made the point that it was moved to fall homecoming back in the 70s, and it was focused around the men's soccer game celebrating its 60th year before football was here. Rusty Scarborough made a great point in his Tales of the Creek podcast with Stan Cole. The soccer culture on this campus is immense. Yes. And it, it dates back, like you said, to the late 60s, early 70s. People love soccer in this state. I mean, we know it with North Carolina's success on both the men's and women's side. So it's a great area. I think that the night game's always a neat atmosphere. Yeah. The other teams show up. They support each other. We've, we've mentioned that before. But Campbell went 5-1 against Longwood. They got their B-dubs in Farmville, the best place to eat Buffalo Wild Wings. And then they kick some Longwood. Yep. You know what? I mean, they dominated that match. Yep. So Campbell will will end what is going to be a fantastic homecoming Saturday at 8 o'clock. And we talked about if, if, if you, again, you haven't been on campus for many different reasons uh, over the past couple years. 
the orange and black wrestling um, preseason. Basically, it's the wrestle off to see who gets the, the who gets the spots in the first match. It takes place outside of the front of Gore Arena, around where the camel statue is. They put the mats outside. It has become a highlight event, and it starts at 11 right before the parade at 12. They make a great weekend out of it. So at Aviator Social up in Fuquay on Friday, they have alumni matches where former wrestlers compete against current wrestlers. Yeah, that, that's a new one, and that's going to be good until somebody pulls something. Right, so maybe yeah. the, the alumni will keep an eye on that. Yeah. But they have a nice dinner after the football game, so it's a whole cool day. And then when you're at the parade, you get to watch live sports too during yeah. the parade. And those wrestlers, I mean, there's good music playing. There's yeah. a couple hundred people and, watching. And it's just not an exhibition. It's Campbell versus Campbell, but with the depth that Scotty Sintes and the, and the wrestling team has put together. Again, it's a top, it's a top 30 ranked wrestling program that, that wins year after year. But these guys are fighting for spots in the starting lineup. You mentioned it. Four-time reigning SoCon champions. And, and the 20 wrestlers in that wrestle-off, they want to earn the spot match one, right, to start the year. Yep. So it matters to them. It matters to the fans. Wrestling alumni are intense. And they'll start heckling and cheering, and each coach has their own team of, of wrestlers. So it, it's a cool day. Campbell football game at four. Charleston Southern comes into town. Campbell has never beat Charleston Southern again. They've only played three times as as scholarship programs. Isn't but, it great, Chris, that we're ten minutes into this and yeah, we just mentioned there's right? a football game? Yeah, that's why there, there there's so much going on, and with all of the fall teams doing well, Campbell, the football team, really showing us on the field. A complete 60-minute game, special teams, offense, defense. They won 48-18, to 18, beat by 30, an NC Central team that was ranked two weeks before and receiving votes in the top 25. Now Campbell is receiving votes in the top 25 polls. What I love about that last performance, it was dominant from the start, which we expected, but 500 yards of yeah. offense. In the third quarter, Coach Weed and the offensive coordinator said, well, we struggled. And yet they still scored 48 points and had 500 yards of offense. So if that intensity can translate to this week against Charleston Southern and next week against Robert Morris, you're looking at a 2-0 and start in the conference, which has not happened in Campbell history. There's a five-game Big South conference schedule. You win those five games, regardless of what happens anywhere else, you're going to the FCS playoffs. Campbell is trying to do it for the first time in program history. Past years, you may have been able to win the conference with one conference loss. I don't know if that happens this year. I think there's going to be a lot of parity below NC, a and and Campbell. So these are two games you got to have if you're going to go to the FCS playoffs. So it's a big couple of weeks uh, and a big homecoming Saturday. Mike Menner has talked all season. Our season begins right now in Big South play. They haven't had the best Big South record in the past, but Monmouth has left the league. Kennesaw State, those were the two... 1A, 1B every year. The league's wide open yeah. for someone to win it. And this is the final year of being in the Big South. What a great chance to – obviously you have to win all the games in your conference, but homecoming, atmosphere, team you've never beaten in Charleston Southern and you want to do it for the first time, why not in front of 6,000 people? You can keep track of everything at Go Camels. We'll get you to the main athletic page. We're going to have people covering everything all day. You can also get the schedules, gocamels.com. And on the university side, Evan, where should they go to keep track of everything homecoming? Well, we updated the website this week. At Campbell EDU, it's the main landing page. It says homecoming events. You just press the button. It leads you to all the different schedules, activities, where you can sign up for stuff. So just show up to campus and, and figure it out. But if you do need some info, it's online. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. If you can't make it to town, make sure you're following along. Me, Evan, and Jay Sunhalter will bring you the broadcast of the homecoming game on ESPN+. Plus. 4 o'clock coming up on Saturday. Coming up after the break, oh, by the way, it's fall, and the Major League Baseball playoffs have started with some Campbell, former Camels, in the playoffs. We talk about that. We talk about... Justin Hare, 15 years here, building a program that was at the bottom of Division I into one of the top programs. Coach Hare is coming up after the break. My thanks to Evan. Happy homecoming, everybody. Camel Call Friday rolls on after this. Planning a tailgate? Then it's bow time. Bojangles has everything you need for the perfect tailgate, no matter how many fans you're trying to feed. 
There's the original tailgate, the super tailgate, and for a really big crowd, the jumbo tailgate special. And if you like your chicken off the bone, choose the Supreme's tailgate special that includes 12 perfectly seasoned tenderloin fillets. So grab the tickets, get that Bojangles tailgate special, and go. It's bow time. Thanks to donors like you, the Fighting Camel Club provides championship resources for Camel student athletes. Over the last three years, donations to the Fighting Camel Club have helped fund facility enhancements and coach-driven projects that have pushed the Fighting Camels to win 27 conference championships. For more information on how you can donate to the Fighting Camel Club, go to GoCamels.com and click on the Give icon. The Fighting Camel Club, providing championship resources for Camel student athletes. Better ingredients, better pizza, better brace yourself because Papa John's has done it again. Introducing Papa Bowls. No crust, just a whole bunch of those Papa John's toppings you love. Baked to piping hot perfection. I'm talking crisp veggies, savory meats all covered in melty cheese and those signature sauces. Try flavors like Italian Meats Trio, Chicken Alfredo and Garden Veggie or get creative and build your own Papa John's. Welcome back to our Friday Camel Call. It has been a decade and a half in the creek for Justin Hare, first as an assistant helping to bring the program back to the NCAA tournament for the first time since the 90s. Then, since he took over as Campbell's head coach in 2015, the team has averaged 30 wins a year, won seven Big South trophies, gone to the NCAA tournament four times, been a win away from the Super Regionals. He is also a father of four and a great Twitter follow, (laughs) Mr. Justin Hare. Coach, how are you? I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me on. I'm softened you up with that because I'm going to start with uh, with the big questions. I usually say for uh, for later on a resume like that. That's usually what's read off by an AD at a big state university before he introduces you as their new baseball coach. Why have you stayed here at Campbell? I know you've had other opportunities elsewhere. Why is Campbell the place for you? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the first piece about being here is, uh, and I think that once people get here and they spend some time here, they can really see that, that there is a special draw to this place. And um, coming here in, in the fall of 2007, you know, I told my then girlfriend, now wife at the time, like, hey, we'll be here for two or three years. We'll get this thing spun around. We'll get back in the going in the right direction. And then we'll be off somewhere else and and get an opportunity. And and here we are 15 years later and still trying to to build this thing into a monster. And I think that's probably been the funnest piece of of showing up to work here every day. One, it's a special place that that has its own unique draws to it and and attractions and and great people and and great area for sure. But the most exciting piece on a day to day basis is that that we've literally been able to build our program into almost anything we've wanted it to become. Um, Not that we've always been told yes right away, not that anybody's come in with a magic wand or a $15 million check and said, here, build whatever facility you want and, and and get everything you want. We've We've had to, to, to work very hard to build the program into what we've wanted it to become. But every dream, every vision that we've had, we've been able to chase that and, and go achieve that and then try to find that next mountain to, to climb and build. And I don't think that we've reached our ceiling here yet. And I don't think that, that that's something that you find everywhere. You can literally kind of stamp your own legacy here, at least within our program, and and leave it a lot better than how you found it and and i think that there's other places that might have a cooler name across the front of their uniform but i mean that legacy is kind of already stamped you're just another you're just another cog in the wheel i think we're still constructing the wheel here um you started constructing this wheel 15 years ago in a program that at the time was not in a very good place take me back to then and what did it take? How did you make a not very good at the time baseball program into a good baseball program? And realize I don't say great because I have a follow up question to that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think um, 
in 2007, they, they had some, some coaching turmoil. Coach resigned in the middle of the year. Assistant took over. They went 11-45 and 45 in the spring of, of 2007. Um, and so walking in the door, we certainly knew that we had a lot of, of work to do. Um, Coach Goff was, was my boss at the time, and he was coming from a Division II program. I was an assistant in a Division II program. And, you know, we walk into a facility that's, you know, in, in our eyes at that time was, was pretty nice, man. We had lights, which was great. There was brick down the walls. It was awesome. You know, like this is way better than what I had at Washita Baptist University in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, you know. And so, you know, we, we, we had a, a vision and a mindset of like, hey, man, we're, we're – we're just some blue collar guys that we're going to come in here, man. We're going to have some edge to us because we're just, you know, blue collar, hardworking guys that, that we're going to just try to find some toughness and, and find some guys that, that want to play for guys that, that have some toughness. And so we just try to go about finding the right fits. And, and, and that was a process, right? We didn't know the area. We didn't know the, the history of the school. I think anytime you get, somewhere new, you, you have to, at some point you have to find a niche, right? Like what, what can you be really good at where you are? And, and for us that ended up being junior college recruiting, um, ended up being a huge piece of, of, of kind of the resurgence of our program was finding junior college players that could come in and and you know kind of steady the waters for us i mean there's 19 i think at the time there was 19 or 20 division one um, programs in the state and by any accord campbell baseball in 2007 going into 2008 was nowhere close to the top half was probably in the bottom two or three it was probably 17 18 19 somewhere in there um you know so getting really high quality or a lot of really high quality high school guys just not going to work out for us so we needed to, to come up with a, a good plan for for how we were going to attract good enough players to kind of get it turned around um, and then as 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 we kind of started to establish that and take some steps forward we were able to expand you know our recruiting front from kind of regional in the southeast to kind of nationwide and when we started to open up the West Coast for our recruiting purposes, um, man, we, we really started to hit on some really good players from the Pacific Northwest all the way down California, Arizona, um, and, and really started to, to build our, our recruiting brand nationally. And that's helped us out tremendously. You then take over the program as a, as a head coach. So you now have a good program that you've been a part of. How do you take that into a great program that's one win away from the Super Regional like you guys were a few years back against ECU? Yeah, I, I mean, it, that's hard to say because because it, it was such a such a different process. I think when you're an assistant coach, you think that you – assistant coaches are always and, – and I know this because I was one of them for 11 years. They're one of the smartest guys in the room. They always have the answers. They always have the, the creative solutions and the ideas and, and all of those things, which is true. When you get into the big chair, right, like when you become the head coach, like it's not always as easy and it's not always as clear cut. You become the stupidest guy in the room, right? And so – so there's so there's a learning curve there. So what do you do? Like you just try to burn it down, <laughs> right? And then try to rebuild it. <laughs> is it, it, at times is what it felt like. You know, we had a really good team. My first year as head coach had Cedric Mullins, who's who's an all star in the big leagues right now. Um, Heath Bowers was is the career wins leader. He was our Friday guy. We had some really good players. Um, I wasn't as equipped then as I am now, I think, to to be the head coach of that program. We started off really well. And, and so, again, so then it's just a learning process, just like it was as the recruiting guy here at 26 years old trying to figure out what the niche was to, to try to help start building this program into something. I think as a head coach, there's that learning process as well of, of, okay, well, how do we take it to the next level? What works, you know, for, for us with a different staff, with me as a head coach, opposed to, to the recruiting guy or assistant. And then, you know, there, there's, there's a, 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 he's the AD at Delta State now, a guy named Mike Kinnison. 
legendary head baseball coach there at Delta State, one of the best Division II programs in the in the country. And uh, our former pitching coach, Rick McCarty, worked for him. Greg Goff is really good friends with Coach Kinnison. Just a tremendous tree. And, and he had a saying that, that we've kind of always adopted. If it, if it ain't – like the, the saying typically goes, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Like he said it a different way, and I think it's tremendous, and I, and I do believe it's true. If it, if it ain't broke, break it and build it back better. And, and so I think like – taking something from a, a good program and trying to mold it into a great program. I think that there, there was plenty of, we need to break some things that maybe we thought we were doing okay and try to figure out how to build them back better. And, and I think that that's where we've been able to get the last three or four or five years from where we were, you know, the first couple of years of, of me being in the head coach role. Um, you talked about that you are now not only winning games, but really what you have been for the past 10 years, putting guys into the major leagues. You mentioned Cedric, MLB All-Star, Orioles starting fielder. Ryan Thompson, who is going to be in the playoffs with Tampa, appeared in 47 games this year. He's 3-3 three and three for the Rays, 3.80 ERA. He's going to be making another postseason run. His playoff numbers, um, unbelievable. Zach Neto, speaking of, 13th overall draft pick, he not only – was the 13th overall draft pick. He got in and was raking it. Double A, hitting over 300. They won. They won a conference. They won a division title. Seven other players in the minors, including Alan Winans and Spencer Packard, both of whom are in the Arizona Fall League, which you don't get to the Arizona Fall League unless they think you have a chance to make it in the bigs. Just, just incredible the, the development of these guys who a lot of them did not come into your program as draft prospects and future major leaguers. Yeah, and it's it, I mean it's just been phenomenal um to see the the growth since since we've been here we've had four guys make appearances in the big leagues. There's been 11 in school history and four of them have been in the last since 2015. So Matt Marksbury was the first one um that we had coached here that made it to the big leagues. So literally in the last 7 years 40% of the big leaguers in school history have have made appearances, right? And and Cedric Mullins is an all-star. Ryan Thompson pitched in the World Series two years ago. Um, we've had three guys that go, have gone in the first round, like just continue to, to set some records. I think that it's a testament to our coaching staff going out and, and recruiting our coaching staffs, guys that have been here, um, still here, you know, going out and finding the right players, finding the right fits, making connections. Um, and then just our commitment as as a staff to try to to have a program that develops guys, helps guys get better. We don't want guys any at any point in their career or or, or you know not just athletically but socially and and just overall. We want them walking out of here as better people, better players. We want them to walk out as a different man than they walked in. And so there's a, a big commitment to that. But then, honestly, man, like it's it's really about the the young men that that have the the courage and faith to join our program, and come in and punch the time clock and and go to work every single day. We can have the best developmental plan for anybody in the entire world. We can have the coolest things and the neatest toys. But if you don't show up and go to work and punch the time clock and have some commitment and have some professionalism about you, you don't become a first rounder. You don't become a draft pick by accident um, and every single one of those guys that, that's playing pro ball that's had the opportunity to put on our uniform and, and go on and sign a professional contract um, and a million other guys that probably had a chance or or, or had the talent but but didn't get the chance um, their work ethic and, and commitment to um, improving themselves is the difference maker coach thank you for the time we're out of time we'll pick this up uh on another podcast in the future and talk some fall ball. Awesome. That'll do it for us. For Evan, Coach Hare, I'm Chris saying so long. Have a great weekend. Happy homecoming, everybody. <laughs>